Yesterday we covered well, a lot of things. We covered new conservatives. Um, for the notebook check, by the way, I don't remember which notebook page it is. I think it's 38 or 39. I can't remember which one. Uh, for new conservatives, you don't have to write the whole thing because we did it yesterday. So if you did that section yesterday and wrote that down, you can show me that instead of notebook 39 or what, whichever new conservative one is. If you didn't, you just kind of get the notebook page, if that makes sense. All right, but you'll have to show me either one. Uh, so new conservatives, we got that. That's the whole day. Done. Uh, and we did a lot of nationalism. So we actually covered part of two different notebook pages on this. Uh, and we'll round it off today. So we did nationalism. We did unifications. Got that. Check. We got uh, expansion uh, with uh, France, showing that as an example. And next we'll get uh, separation or independence. Uh, and that's gonna be nationalistic as well. And then we'll continue with liberalism. Hopefully we get that done today, or at least a good chunk of it done today in the 19th century. That's our goal. Let's get those. And then we'll continue with uh, the more radical things like uh, anarchism, Marxism, Zionism. Um, is that it? And then, yeah, then after that, it's just scientific beliefs. So, okay. Picking up from yesterday on nationalism, uh, we have a pretty clear understanding of what that is. We've talked about the unifications of Italy, Germany, expansion of France, and then, of course, retraction when Napoleon III lost to. Uh, uh, against Mexico and, uh, of course, against Germany. Uh, now we're going to talk about countries trying to break away from um, imperial control. So I have like one, not it's not all the same, but they're pretty common as far as an ethnic ethnicity goes, uh, group in southern and eastern Europe that are largely controlled by other imperial powers. So you know what they are and give me maybe a couple examples if you know a couple examples. You had it first, but then you kind of did this, so I don't know what that means. I'm thinking, come to me later. <laughs> <laughs> later. Speak someone else will leave. All right. <laughs> Slavs and Serbia and Bulgaria. Okay, yeah, Slavic people. Actually, Bulgarians are Bulgars, but um, would you say Serbia? Yeah. And then try to pick another one. Um, I can tell you if it's Slavic or not, ish. Uh, uh, which is, which is like, yeah, Czechs, the Czech people, I believe, are, are, are a brand of Slavic, yes. Um, those are mostly in uh, Austria, and you mentioned the Bulgars, which are, as far as I know, they're not Slavic, but they are also under imperial control by another. Okay, we'll start first with um, a lot of the Slavs and a group called the Hungarians in Austria. Okay, so Hungarians are here. We've actually heard a bit about them before when we talked about Joseph II, because he tried doing a bunch of reforms that were super liberal, but he had to go back on them. Why do you have to go back on them? Unrest. Okay, why? Who? Who particularly? The Hungarians. Yeah, the Hungarians. Uh, there were a bunch of Slavs also in the Czechs and Bohemia uh, that were um, upset. But he needed them to unite because he had enemies on the borders uh, in France and in Russia. So he couldn't have internal conflicts plaguing him. So he had to just pull all the reforms back to make them happy. That's going to be the same two groups that are really opposing the Austrian control uh, during the mid 19th century, uh, all the way toward, towards the uh, latter part of the 19th century. So Austrians, remind me, what are they? Just, just say it. German. German, German right. Uh, they are not the largest group, though, at least by population, in this Austrian Empire. There's actually more Slavs, different types of Slavs, like Croatians and Slovenians and Czech and Slovakian and Serbian and, and others, uh, and Hungarians. So in the 1860s, Austria is really going to struggle to uh, maintain control of these various ethnic groups because they want freedom uh, or independence or at least autonomy, the right to do whatever they want um, in their own area. Why is Austria in the 1860s afraid that they can't hold on any longer? And I mean this because before they at least had some insurance that other European powers might help them keep control. But after the Crimean War, that concert of Europe is over. Is it because now they're, in, now they're in more of like all the big problems. Yeah, exactly. I actually accidentally gave you the answer, but then you elaborated on it. Yeah. The concert of Europe's over. That age of Metternich where they cooperate to keep the governments, the status quo of nobility and monarchs in power, it's gone. And the Crimean War, 
And now they're actually fighting directly with some of those neighbors <coughs> that used to uh, help guarantee their government state. So they don't have a guarantee anymore. Uh, as a result, they know in the long run they're not going to be able to hold on to uh, all of these ethnic groups peacefully. So the biggest group besides the German Austrians is who? Or I should say the most powerful single group. They're actually the, not the biggest ethnic group, but... Hungarians. Yeah, the Hungarians. Uh, so, do you know what kind of uh, government they're going to adopt to keep the Hungarians happy? Uh, not Democratic? Good guess. Dual monarchy. A dual monarchy. What does that mean? Oh, they fight each other? No. Um, <laughs> all right, so they try to um, have both e ethnic groups in a, in a government, like, like it's how Austria Hungary came to be. Yeah. So what's a dual monarchy mean? Two monarchs. Two monarchs, right, yeah. So you have a monarch in Austria uh, that, that's looking over the, the the greater part of the empire, and you also have a monarch in, in Hungary who has just as much authority, at least there in Hungary. So the agreement was they're still supposed to work with Austria when it comes to foreign wars, like if, I don't know, Russia or the Ottoman Empire, whoever is at their gates or on the borders, they're taking territory. The Hungarians are supposed to contribute to that, but otherwise Austria is not supposed to meddle in the uh, kingdom of, of Hungary at all. So that's after 1967. They're going to start making that uh, concession. So uh, as far as separatist movements, uh, we're going to have the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary. So it's not just the Austrian Empire anymore. It's the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And don't forget, <coughs> Hungary, we mean like Huns, like the Uralic people. Uh, Lord, why don't you go out and get a drink of water or something? All right. Um, Austria-Hungary. So... There's the other ethnic group that's there that is also quite unhappy, that also wants some autonomy. They don't get dual monarchy status, but they do at least get a lot more control in their own regions, in this, in this zone, this area. Slavs. Yeah, the Slavs in the uh, Croatia, Croatia, Slovenia uh, zone. So there's going to be a Croatia, Slovenia autonomous zone, which pretty much means they largely run themselves to keep them happy. So Austria is using a lot of what we call appeasement. Appeasement means you give them what they want so that what doesn't happen? Yeah, they don't rebel, right, and fight against you. Uh, you. You don't want the conflict. So it's kind of like a new conservative approach, somewhat similar, uh, but it's, uh, it's going to be uh, the beginning of the end for Austria-Hungary. They're only going to last another, what, 50 years or so, uh, and then they're no longer going to exist anymore. They're going to be broken up into a whole bunch of different countries. But they hold on for now, uh, and that's because of their uh, concessions from 1867 forward. So Hungary, by itself, they're only going to help out militaristically on foreign fronts, and then uh, the area of Croatia, Slovenia, is going to be um, largely autonomous too. So Austria has uh, maintains its empire, but it's going to uh, lose a lot of actual, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Influence over the entire empire, right, to Hungary and Croatia and Slovenia. All right, that was a pretty simple one, I think, anyway. So that's why we go from calling it the Austrian Empire to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, they are going to share that title and authority with the Hungarian people, the largest or most powerful other ethnic group. There are, though, and we've already mentioned, a lot of Slavs that uh, want freedom for their own ethnic group, right? So Serbians are one, um, uh, the Czech people are one, the Slovakians are others, uh, Romanians too, although they're not Slavic, but they all want to run their own countries and determine their own governments. Uh, what's the movement, I don't even know if it's on the notes that you've ever written so far, what's that movement where all these countries, particularly Slavic countries, want to break free and start and maintain their own autonomous states. Pan-Slavism? Yeah, pan-Slavism. Can you give me two examples that uh, I just gave a bunch? Can you name a couple? Uh, yeah, like uh, independent Slavic groups that want freedom. Because it's not like they want to start a Slavic super nation, because Russia is also Slavic. Bulgaria? Bulgarians are not Slavic, but they do also want freedom. Serbia? Serbia, that's one. Can you name one more? Okay, that was good. I'll still give you a point for that. What you got? Uh, Croatia. Croatia, yeah. Or Slovenia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, any of those would work. Okay, this, uh, like you said, is known as pan-Slavism. So this is part of the separatist independence movement for nationalism. They don't get 
separation, but they do get a lot of independence, the Hungarians and the Croatian Slovenes. We also have another movement going at the same time known as Pan-Slavism. Uh, in fact, at the time, there's only one major Slavic ethnic group that has its own autonomous empire. I already mentioned it's Russia. So Russia supports this, uh, but they're not trying to form like uh, a super nation of Slavic people. It's not like pan-Germanism, like Germans unite and you know spread. This is going to be a uh, set Slavic groups free from imperial power. What are my two? Can we get the door? Because those PE kids are just having so much fun out there. Um, what are my two main empires that are controlling large Slavic groups that don't want to be controlled? I, I realize there's a few Slavic groups in Rus the Russian Empire that are, but I'm not counting them. My, my main two. Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary, and that's one. Germany. Nope. Yes. Get one more try. There's only one more empire in the region. Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, yes. Uh, imperial power. Uh, and that's going to be mostly from Austria-Hungary and also the Ottoman Empire. All right, so the two big movements that I want to talk about here, one of them is Pan-Slavic, uh, and the other is not Pan-Slavic, but it's in the same region, it's in the Balkans, uh, are going to be the independence movement for Serbia And that's going to be a long one. There's a lot of on and off conflicts and settlements. Uh, and it goes basically from 1804 all the way to 1876, I think. It's the 1870s. I don't remember the exact year. Uh, but they're going to be fighting for their freedom. Actually, technically from two empires, but they only get it from one. What's the empire that roughly two-thirds of them actually get independence from, while the other third remains under the control of another empire until later? You know? The Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman empire right. So they're going to uh, actually establish the country of Serbia in, oh, maybe it was 1868. Hold on, maybe I wrote this down. Come on me, I did not though. I put 1860s, so that's what I'm gonna change it to. 1860s, man, I wanna say 68, but don't quote me. Uh, they actually established Serbia as a country. So yay them. Um, what other Balkan nation has recently gotten independence from the Ottoman Empire uh, a couple decades earlier. Greek. Yeah, Greece. And there's one more that I talked about, not Slavs, but there's one more group that broke free from a revolution at the same time in 1830 uh, as the Greeks. Bulgaria. Not Bulgaria, but they will right after Serbia. You move your hand, but then you put it down. It was from way earlier. Revolution 1830. This is one of the few successful ones where they break free from the power of the, of the Dutch and start their own nation. Nope. Nope. Belgium. Belgium, yes. There we go. So we have the Serbian independence movement. We have, this is much earlier, obviously. Oh, no, let me put that in parentheses earlier. Uh, we got Greek independence and Belgian independence. So there's, there's a lot to choose from here, guys. Uh, right after Serbia, they're going to have Bulgaria, which is over here. So here's Serbia. All right, but let's not forget, there are some Serbians still under control by another empire. The one that's really close, just shout it. Aust yeah, Austria-Hungary, right. That's going to be a problem later for World War I. Um, <coughs> and then the Bulgarians are down in this region here. All right, so we have uh, Bulgarian independence. Or at least autonomy in the 1870s. So that's a lot of examples. Um, you can pick any which one you want to talk about on the AP test, but you should know that these are all currently countries and they all roughly get their independence in this same period from like 1830 to about 1870 or so. And again, what's pushing that? Why are all these nations all of a sudden popping up, these tiny nations? Nationalism. Yeah, nationalism, right? That's the big surge. So either unite common people, right, unify, uh, expand the one you already have, like France, uh, or separate from imperial control to make your own ethnic, you know, nationalistic nation state. Uh, and that's going to be, take your pick, Serbia, Greece, Belgium, Bulgaria, all of those are going to work. And there's two more conflicts I want to briefly mention here that really are kind of almost like the last examples of nationalism. World War I is kind of the last big example, but this is right before World War I and helps lead to it. Uh, there's one conflict, well, there's actually two that are the same thing, but they're right after one another. There's the First Balkan War. 
that's from 1912 to 1913. And then there's the Second Balkan War, yeah. <coughs> 1913. And these are pretty simple, and this is an excellent example of nationalism. So this is when Greece, the first one, Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria, and was it Montenegro? Some other small country. They are going to fight against the Ottoman Empire to drive them out of Europe um, almost entirely. So they basically take all of the remaining territory in the Balkans except for that tiny little sliver that's over here uh, where there's not Istanbul. So that's the first Balkan War. So it's, uh, again, Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, Montenegro versus the Ottoman Empire. All right, makes sense. Ottoman Empire gets worked and they push them right on out. So yay them, they get to make these big, large nations. <coughs> However, there's a problem. They don't agree on the territory. So, surprise to everybody, um, Bulgaria turns its back, not its back, betrays, that's a better word. <coughs> Bulgaria betray, betrays its uh, allies and actually tries to uh, take more territory from them. So then it becomes Bulgaria versus the remainder, Serbia, Greece, Macedonia, and I think the Ottoman Empire actually gets in a little bit and takes a little bit of territory back. So they don't do so well. That's the second one. But what could I say was the cause of both of these wars and how? I'll give you double market bucks for giving me the what it was and how it was that. Imperialism. Okay. That wasn't what I was going for, but, but explain it. Maybe I'll give it to you. The Ottoman Empire controlling um, some of the Balkan region and then the Austria-Hungary controlling it. And they wanted to form their own nation. <coughs> okay, so that wouldn't be imperialism, it'd be what? Nationalism. Nationalism, okay. But hold on, you're not entirely wrong. They already have their own nations here. What are they trying to do? Expand. Expand it, right, so that would make it nationalism. Okay, cool. That's the first one. What about the second one? one. There's only one tiny difference. It's just that instead of being against the Ottoman Empire, it's against Bulgaria. Is it still nationalism? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because Bulgaria is trying to expand. Yeah, exactly. They're just trying to expand their national state or their nation state territory. So all of these are examples of uh, nationalism, whether it's forming their own nation or expanding the nations they already have. All right? That's tons of examples. You won't even need that many examples for the AP test, but there's all the different ways that nationalism manifests itself. Unifying, expanding, or starting your own nation state based on your common ethnicity. You guys got that? All right, I would know at least one solid example for each. So whether it's, if you wanna go Germany, and then France, or the Balkan Wars, and then you know any, any independence movement um, in Serbia or Greece or Bulgaria or wherever, just remember like one for each and you should be pretty solid with that. Uh, but just know all of it's happening right here in a like three, four decade span uh, in the 19th century because of nationalism, all right? Big movement. And the uh, only other thing I want you to know about that is it is not the Enlightenment, it is counter-Enlightenment, right? Anytime I say my group's better than your group and then they, you go out to try to uh, show that or at their expense, that is the opposite of the Enlightenment. That's, uh, that's counter-Enlightenment, that's romanticism. We good on nationalism? All right, cool. We'll talk later after liberalism about how this is going to uh, cause a lot of problems uh, for the Jewish people, and it's also gonna cause a lot of people to question if these governments are good or bad, and of course, Marx and uh, Bakunin are gonna say they are bad. All right.